Thank you for joining me for another episode of Gatehouse Insights. And today I have the pleasure of chatting with Ben Fee, who is the Managing Director at Fee Finney McDonald. Ben, welcome to the show and thank you for joining me. Thanks for inviting me. So let's begin with your legal career story. Um, yeah, so um, I um, spent 14 years working at Slater and Gordon. Um, I started at a, as a junior legal assistant and um, basically worked my way up through the ranks. Um, in the end, um, I was the head of class actions and group litigation in both Australia and the UK um, before sort of going off and starting a new venture. Can you tell us about the highs and lows of leading the teams? Um, look, I mean, over 14 years you obviously have a lot of highs and lows, um, but you know, by and large, um, yeah, it was, a, it was a really amazing and, and a really positive experience. Um, even as an article clerk, I, uh, I found myself thrown into um, the James Hardy inquiry, which was up in Sydney. Um, and so I got to spend, you know, 10 months working with Peter Gordon and Ken Fowley and Jack Rush QC, um, which was an incredible experience. Um, at the time, uh, Peter Gordon was joking to me that um, the best, uh, best case of my life had been the first and you know it was only downhill from there um, and he I don't think he, he wasn't right but you know I certainly saw where he was coming from um, so yeah an incredible experience but um, ever since then um, the opportunity to work in this area of law and to practice in class action litigation um, every day is a new and exciting adventure. Have you always done class action? Um, no I started off as a uh, personal injury lawyer um, did asbestos litigation for the first you know 12 months or so um, moved into commercial litigation after that, primarily financial services, um, but then sort of found my way into class actions. Um, it got to the GFC and you know quite a few um, companies started collapsing and Slater and Gordon's interest sort of re-emerged after that. How did you get your position as a legal assistant at Slater's? Um, it was actually after I was um, given an article clerkship. Um, I called up the uh, then managing director and um, demanded a job for my um, last year of university um, and he uh, obliged. So yeah, it was a fantastic experience though. I, um, I kind of feel that I've, I did every single job that there was to do in that place, you know, putting together briefs and sort of photocopying and all those sorts of things. I, um, I, uh, I really enjoyed all of it. So was that Peter Gordon that you... I uh, know that was Andrew Grech, so yeah. Um, yeah, so um, going back many years ago now. Yeah, wow, 14 years. That's awesome. From your experience, What's one tip you'd give lawyers that want to manage and lead teams? Um, probably the greatest tip would be, um, are you sure you want to be a manager? Um, they're very different skill sets and um, I do think that um, as lawyers we can kind of get a bit preoccupied with the next step, you know, with the next rung on the ladder. Um, you know, people are you know, often high achieving and get very focused on, you know, climbing, um, you know, climbing uh, as many rungs as they can, as fast as they can. And um, I've encountered many lawyers in my time who um, have got exactly what they wanted, you know, and then found that they hated it. Um, it's a very different sort of skill set. Um, I think that to be a good manager, you need to have strong empathy. Like you need to be able to you know, view your own success as a product of the success of your team and, you know, the success of your firm. Um, and I think that some lawyers are not great at that. So, uh, just that it's not for everyone and to be um, authentic to, you know, actually who you are and what you are, what's going to make you happy in the long term. What are some other skills that lawyers need to be a really excellent manager? Um, I think that, you know, to be a manager, um, you need to um, listen more than you speak, which I still struggle with. Um, I think that you, uh, you also need to have a long-term perspective, not get too sort of preoccupied on the short term. Understand what your immediate objectives are, but to not, you know, fall into error um, and, you know, uh, make sort of false steps because you get too preoccupied with, you know, the next milestone or the next balance day. Um, I also think that many man I guess many lawyers as managers can frankly take themselves too seriously. They don't pay enough attention to the kind of workplace and the culture that they're creating. You know, they can get a bit lost in their own sort of stress, you know, and not necessarily, um, you know, uh, understand that they're kind of having an impact on the rest of their team. You know, so, so I think that many lawyers can be um, very successful managers. They can be effective. They can make remarkable amounts of money and all of those sorts of things. Um, but they can also create a very toxic culture and leave behind a lot of victims. And, you know, that's certainly not what we um, are setting out to achieve. For lawyers that don't want to take that next step, let's say the firm's pushing them to go to the next the position, which is manager, what would you say to them to, to let their firm know that that's not what they want? Well, I mean, I mean first of all, um, 
it's probably not a bad problem to have if people are you know, desperately pushing you to have that next promotion. Um, but second of all, I think that candour and you know, good honest conversations um, is always the obvious starting point. You know, it, it starts off by you have to know yourself what you're good at and you know, what's going to get the most out of you and what's going to make you and the people around you happy. You know, and I think if you can't have that conversation with you know, your direct superior um, or firm management, then you're probably in the wrong place. I want to move on to class actions. What's been one big case, the most interesting case you've worked on? Um, well, they're all big and interesting in you know, their own um, different ways, but probably the most memorable case for me is actually one that I wasn't running. Um, I was a, um, a pa bit of a passenger. I, came a, I was lucky enough to supervise it towards the tail end, um, and that was a class action. Um, we call it the Fairbridge Farm class action. Um, it was brought on behalf of um, a, a whole series of former child migrants um, came across from the UK um, and they suffered some pretty horrific um, institutional abuse um, sort of yeah middle of last century and um, in that particular matter I mean the clients to a to a single person were just absolutely fantastic just really lovely and genuine people who um, had really you know endured a lot um, you know very, at a very young age and without parents um, and so yeah to be able to um, be involved in a case that represented them was fantastic and I think the most the most memorable part of that case was that um, it wasn't only the damages result that was achieved for them at the end it was the fact that the government um, and the primary defendant apologized you know and to sort of see you know a group of people who'd been through so much actually receive that form of acknowledgement it's pretty rare in litigation so you know that that's why it's a result that really does sort of stand out for me um, it was a very big testament to the team and the firm for running that case was that through Slater's? It was, yes. How long did that case run for? Um, it went for oh, several years. Um, it was very hard fought. Um, lots of um, interlocutory motions and contests, you know, um, applications for um, declassing and the like. Um, and it, um, I guess that kind of journey, um, it sort of, on the one hand, um, it made the result um, sweeter. Um, on the other hand, it was also bittersweet because um, the tactics that were you know, applied by the defendants through the majority of that case it meant that, um, unfortunately, there were a few clients who didn't um, live to see the result. So, yeah, slightly somber moment for that as well. Now, once you shift us to a new firm, Fee Finney McDonald, can you share a little bit about your journey leading up to it? What made you start it, and um, what clients and when work you're doing? Um, sure. Well, I mean, we've established ourselves as a, as a class action law firm. It's what you know the three founding partners are best known for. Um, but really. Um, it's kind of nice to have the freedom to, you know, do any type of litigation. We, um, we'll, we'll focus on class actions, obviously, but not just shareholder class actions, um, institutional abuse claims, other types of claims, um, and also different forms of complex litigation. Um, we already have a, uh, a flourishing pro bono practice, which is um, not, you know, necessarily what you do when you just start a new firm, but it's something that's really important to us, and it's, um, it's really nice to be able to get involved and, and give back to the community. Um, in terms of what brought us here, I mean, it would really, um, a strong desire for um, self-determination to take back um, control of our own destinies, I think is the best way of putting it. What type of pro bono work are you doing? Um, we're, we're doing a lot of asylum seeker work at the moment, so um, which is you know an area that's um, pretty uh, you know a point of passion for most of us. How do you find your clients like, get this type of pro bono work? Um, mainly through referrals. Um, there's there's no shortage of people um, in society, unfortunately, who. Um, need legal help um, and yeah if we can you know make our skills available then I think it's important it's part of our professional ethics to do so. And you've re recently set up in Sydney so you're now in Melbourne and Sydney what are your future plans and dreams for the business? Um, uh, look we we don't operate to any particular growth target or KPI or anything like that um, it's one of the pleasures of you know being a bit smaller um, we we're going to measure our success based on I guess the results that we deliver, you know, um, it's, it, it's why we hope that we're going to be successful. Um, all that said, uh, I do feel that we have some unfinished business in the United Kingdom. What is it? Uh, look, I mean, we, um, I was only there for 10 months in the end and um, I think that there are some good opportunities that we'd be interested to explore at the right time you know, in the future. Can you um, share your experiences working in the UK and Australia? What's the differences? Um, I think there are... Um, a lot of similarities actually, um, that um, the people over there um, were fantastic, the, uh, the courts themselves operate to quite similar rules, 
um, I think that Australians are um, often regarded as being, you know, perhaps a little bit more, um, a little bit more sort of aggressive and a bit more sort of adventurous. Um, but you know, that said, I don't. Th I think the the differences are sometimes overstated. Um, but yeah, it was a um, an incredible experience and one that you know um, we certainly learned a lot from. Will you practice there again? Um, we'll see. I'll see. And before we wrap up, can you share what you love about your work? Um, I love all of it. Um, and, you know, um, as a, I guess a founding partner, it would be pretty disappointing if I didn't. Um, but no, um, I enjoy the management aspects. Um, I've, I'm one of the lawyers that actually enjoys that type of thing. Um, and, you know, um, so I, I enjoy those aspects. I also, though, um, there's a good sort of sense of energy about the workplace. There's a real sort of common endeavour. Um, we get to sort of focus very much on, you know, our clients and our work and, you know, delivering, um, you know, a really good quality legal service. Um, and, yeah, there's a really good sort of positive vibe at the moment and one that we're going to definitely try and maintain into the future. What got you into law to begin with? I always wanted to be an architect, actually. Really? Um, yeah, but, um, so I think, you know, I was one of those people that took law as a, uh, almost as a, a sort of a secondary generalist degree. Um, it was only part of the way through my law degree that I actually began to sort of see it as a potential vehicle um, to do some good, you know, to actually affect some positive change, to make a difference to people's lives. Um, my focus had been on uh, politics and student politics and other things like that, you know, um, along with many of my other contemporaries. Um, but yeah, I, I began to sort of see law as something that, you know, wasn't just um, an instrument of oppression, but one that could also be um, an instrument and that could be used for, you know, some pretty profound change. So, yeah, that was the shift. I still, I, I still would like to be an architect, but really? you know, you know, I might have left it a bit late. Oh, you can always still do it. Will you ever think about picking it up? Or? Yeah, well, I mean, you, know, you never know. You you never know. <laughs> ben, this has been wonderful, and thank you for joining me. No problems at all. Thanks for having me. Now, Ben and I would love to hear from you. What is the biggest insight you're taking away from today's conversation? Please comment and share below, and let us know what you think. And if you like this episode, please subscribe to our channels and share this video with your friends. And thank you for watching, and I'll catch you next time on Gatehouse and Friends.